Very good. Well, one of the, one of the things as Hazel is coming up, I think um, I visited with uh, several of the board members. Um, you know, we've had this facilities task force or facilities group that's been out there a number of years, and tonight seems like tonight's the night. Tonight's the night that we get the results both from Hazel and Bill and Peter, and um, uh, we've been very much looking forward to the results. And so, welcome to Shakopee, and thanks for uh, working with us. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, this is the third time in, uh, well, in 10 years. And I think maybe it's the fourth time uh, overall. And so, again, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, superintendent. Uh, I have a short presentation. Well, it, nothing is ever short with me because I <laughs> get a talkative here. Um, I'd like to go through sort of an executive summary that will uh, provide, I hope, a, a good overview of what has happened here and what we then see uh, coming in the next 10 years. As you all know, this is a district that has had very, very rapid enrollment growth, and you can see those stunning numbers of 2,597 uh, students in 10 years at almost 54 percent, which is a very, very rapid growth. During this same period of time, the district's school age population increased by about 3,400 students, or about 60 percent. And your resident enrollment, now preface you do not have a very high percentage of non-resident students, but your resident enrollment increased by about 58%. And when I look at your capture, the public school's capture rate of, of that pool of eligible students who are enrolled in school, you're capturing about 80% of them, which is pretty typical of a Twin Cities suburban uh, district. Um, if you want to think about uh, the other options that students have, in this district, a slightly higher than average number of students and percentage of students attend are in non-public settings, meaning bricks and mortar uh, non-public schools or in home schools. And, and the percentage of students selecting or opting for other public options is lower than average. So you don't lose the same percentage of students to other public options as many districts do. Non-residents make up only 2.5% of your total enrollment, which is, is low compared to a lot of other districts. And I assume it's low because you probably don't have a lot of room. Um, I made four cohort projections. They all show total enrollment increasing over the next 10 years. The highest of these projections shows enrollment increasing by more than 2,000 students and nearly 28%. And just to you know, put a little damper on this, this is only about half the rate of increase that you've experienced. Uh, it's still a, a kind of a breathtaking rate of growth. Uh, the two lowest projections show a decline in K-5, not dramatic but a small decline and you ask why would that happen well it's because district resident births softened after 2007 due to the lower birth rates of the recession years but that's really rebounded since then to the pre-recession levels now the I think it's almost impossible to sort of dodge that bullet I think you will see that especially in the kindergarten class of 2015-16 you will see that. Now, on the other side of the equation, this announcement of 500 new jobs in Shakopee uh, may bring about enough change that you'll get some softening of this trend, uh, you know, that you'll get people who will move with preschool kids. Now, we all know that not all 500 of those jobs will be, uh, people will be living in Shakopee, but it really is a uh, a significant event to have occurred, uh, you know, and I don't think it should be in any way discounted or minimized. <laughs> and the other thing that's really important to remember 
is that the size of your current grades, that is larger elementary grades than middle school grades, larger middle school grades than high school grades, uh, creates a structural growth momentum that really keeps on driving the enrollment of the middle school and high school for the next 10 years because you've got the kids here and they are, the lower grades have many more kids per, per grade and so they will come move through and those middle school and high school enrollments will just continue to increase. Also <coughs> remember that in 10 years, uh, all but two high school grades, if you are on a 9-12 configuration, are already in school. So we're not making assumptions about who's going to be born or anything like that. They're already here, we're just watching them come through. Uh, I have here the numbers of your uh, K-12 total enrollment. Uh, we can add admire those numbers going from 48-14 to 74-11. Uh, pretty dramatic increase. One of the things that demographers especially like to look at is we like to understand what's driving change. And they're basically two simple concepts. Uh, in the population as a whole, are there more births than deaths? And do more people move in than move up? And in the school enrollment, is are there more kindergarten students than the previous year's grade 12? That's a form of natural increased incre decrease. And then the net migration. Do you get more children every year than you would have expected? That is, the uh, mortality rate for school-aged children is very, very low. So we would, if we have uh, 500, let's say, uh, first graders, we would expect to have 500 second graders the following year. And if we have 530 or 540, we know we have net in migration. We don't know that, uh, you know, can't, this is not a way, we're not matching student numbers, we're just looking at the aggregate and the change. And what this, uh, these numbers tell us, well, first of all, we can see that, that the rate of growth, the numbers and the rate of growth was much faster. 10 years ago than it has been recently. However, we know since uh, 2007 we have had a recession and while it is technically over, the, we're only now in 2012 really seeing the pickup in the housing market and the pickup in employment. So it's taken a long time to rebound. As you can see under the natural increase decrease column, uh, that's the difference in the size of the kindergarten class from the previous year's uh, grade 12. So when you have numbers of this magnitude, it's almost impossible not to have growth. And then you add to that the estimate of the net migration, that is people who have moved into the district in net school age kids. And again, you'll see that the numbers were larger pre the recession, and they were smaller, and I'm told that 2009-10, something to do with some subsidy of housing units that came online and stimulated. So we can see how sensitive these numbers are <coughs> to changes in the housing stock. And then this past year was a very tiny number, actually, but we had a huge, still had a huge uh, natural increase. So we have both natural increase and net migration driving your growth. Uh, here I'm showing you a comparison of where you stand versus the state as a whole for education choices. Uh, and this is for the year 2011-12. said Minnesota has chosen for whatever reason not to hurry getting the 2012-13 numbers posted. Um, but 8.1% of enrolled students are in traditional non-public schools and 1.9% in home schools. And you can see you're at 9.5 for the traditional schools, 1.2 for the home school. If we look at public options, 6.4% of Minnesota students uh, choose open enrollment, or it, some of it might be tu uh, tuition, but open enrollment basically. And you can see here that you have about 2.4 in and 5.4 out. So you're a net loser, but nowhere near kind of the flow that occurs statewide. And there are districts, for example, that will have uh, 
33% of their students are non-residents. So we can have some huge numbers. And then you can see statewide, uh, your capture rate is a little higher than the statewide average. However, as I said, your capture rate is, is uh, uh, pretty typical of the metro area. Suburban. Here's enrollment uh, by grade for 10 years. And I tend to do two things when I look at these numbers. One, I look at that kindergarten uh, uh, number across the row to see what's happened with kindergarten. And you can see that the 2009-10 kindergarten uh, was the largest you've had thus far. Then you had uh, a low year for uh, sometimes things happen for reasons we can never quite identify. And then we've had some rebound in the kindergarten class size. If you come down to the grade 12, you can see that your uh, grade 12 is ever increasing in size. If we look down the 2012-13 column, it becomes very, very clear how much larger those elementary grades are compared to the high school grades. I mean, you just see it so easily with the naked eye. And then if you see, if you want to calculate migration, you go from that kindergarten of 2003-4 at 418, it had 447 students in grade one, uh, 441, grade 2, 451, 460, 467, 462, 485, 482, and 519 at grade 9. And the reason that we get such a large bump at grade 9 is that your relatively large non-public uh, enrollment, a very high proportion of those, make the decision to uh, join the Shakopee Public Schools at grade 9. So you can see how that works. And here, just to help you see, I did the average class size. Now here, I'm kind of anticipating where you're going here at K5, 6, 8, and 9, 12. <coughs> so the average class has 625 elementary, uh, 574 at the middle school, and 485 at the high school. Now, with that background, we're faced with the challenge of making enrollment projections. And one of the first things we have to do is make some kindergarten projections. And kindergarten is very, very important for long-term projections, especially 10 years, is because those students are most likely to be with you the entire 10-year period. So uh, it, it becomes very, very, very crucial to the projection. Uh, we have here uh, a column that says district pool. And by that, those numbers represent the births that have been geocoded to the addresses in this district. So these are children whose mothers were residents of this district in the year of these births. We call it a pool because we have adjusted it for September 1st through August 31st, so we had them uh, kindergarten age eligible as opposed to a calendar year. And approximately one third of the births are from September through December. Now what one sees with that pool, of course, is how it has increased in size. And then if you'll recall, I talked about that softening of, of the birth rate. And you can see the pool for it would be one-third of 2006 births and two-thirds uh, two of 2007 births was 824, and that was the pool for the kindergarten class of 2012-13. And now you can see that the softening of the births, we have some decline. And then I want to call your attention, because we've got to be mindful of this, of that 2009-10, it's at 565. But look how it has rebounded. Now I can tell you that in many districts I have worked with in the last four or five months, births have not rebounded. So this has been a very strong rebound back essentially to kind of the pre-recession numbers. And I would expect that they will continue to, to rebound and we'll get some growth. 
Under the percentage column, I'm looking for a way, and I don't, don't want to spend a lot of time talking about alternatives here, but I've looked for a way of calculating, of projecting, estimating the number of births to anticipate in as simple a way as possible. There are lots of theoretical ways to do things, but they become very difficult to actually execute. And you have to make so many assumptions that by the time you finish, you say, I don't know, let's not. So this is really pretty simple. It says, if I can get my pool, and I have confidence that pool is aligned correctly, what percentage was the kindergarten class of that pool of available students? And then how stable are those percentages, and what kind of confidence can we have of that moving forward? Well, when we look at these percentages, we're seeing exactly what we would anticipate. Because that kindergarten class of 2003-04 is much larger than the pool. And we would expect that because Shakopee is growing rapidly, and that kindergarten had many more students made up of people who moved to this district while those children were preschoolers or at the first grade. They were, in other words, they were not born here. But as the growth population growth of the district kept on accelerating, we can see it went from 124, 125, 107, 112, 90, 89, 89, 78, 78, 75. So we're really catching up uh, with uh, a population being born here and a population uh, entering kindergarten. So um, now I'm saying, we know as you, you can look at these numbers and you can see that these uh, move around a little bit. Actually, the last three years, have been very, very stable. And even in the last five to six, uh, reasonably good. That range of movement is, is fairly typical. However, I don't want to reach back so far in time that I'm picking up that 124 or 25%. You see what I'm saying? So I also know that if I average some of these percentages, I have a better chance of getting something that fits going forward than picking a single year because there is this annual fluctuation. So what I have done here is I have taken an average of the past three years and then an average of the past five. Oh, well, I'm myself here. We'll see that. We'll pick that up, but hold that point in mind. What I have here is, is just some, something to put our heads in, in the right place for the coming 10 years. One, the population is getting older. And that's more than just you and me getting a year older. The whole median age of the population is shifting up. And it's, it, we're all going to be middle-aged pretty soon and older. The implications of that is that there's less geographic mobility because older people move less frequently than young people. Uh, there's going to be a decrease in school age population per household. And probably the implication for you is that you have to run the bus around a little more. Uh, for recreation it, or for your own children, playtime is why we, we make play dates because our neighborhoods don't have enough density of kids anymore. Like when you were young, you could just go outside and every house had a kid. And then we have a significant shift in the size of adult age groups. Uh, and our younger age group is not as large or growing as fast as it did in the past decade. So there are some who argue that it may lessen the demand for single family detached housing and we're going to see more units, different units. And the significance of that is that single family detached units overwhelmingly everywhere produce the highest yield of school-aged kids. Now, why am I so confident that births will continue to go up? Well, we know sitting out there is this large Gen Y population, or millennials, as they're called, and they have not come into their prime childhood years. And we know that somewhere 2015, 2017, all the way to about 2027, they will be in the prime childbearing years. And of course, we're having children later, so it probably is going to take them until they're 25, 26, 27, 30, before we see the full impact of this. That tells us 
that, that we can be very confident that births are going to rise in those years uh, at the end of our projection period and beyond. And that will produce another enrollment cycle, the third cycle, where we will have it we will have it start out with rising elementary enrollments, and then you know elementary goes down and the high school enrollments start to increase. And we believe that we will see another large graduating class sometime after 2040. We had the first big one in 1978 when the boomers not to, has not been surpassed. The second one was 2009 statewide. Now we would expect another one somewhere in that 2040. So <coughs> we're looking, what I'm trying to say is whatever we see happening now, uh, we can't get too focused because we know if we keep our eye on that ball, we know there are numbers that are going to be occurring in the future. Now, here are the capture rates that I chose. I chose averaging the past three years, which is at 77.6, past six years at 82.7. And I chose that low percentage for the low assumption and the higher percentage for the high assumption. And I'm applying those against what you saw were the pools. Now, the ringer in all of this is all day kindergarten. Okay. And when I look at your data, uh, I it's, it's hard to say what quite to expect. One of the things I always look at is what percentage inflow do you have between kindergarten and grade one? Because we know that much of that is a result of children attending uh, some private school or daycare center because the public school didn't have all day kindergarten. But that number in your case is not that huge. However, when we go to the state data and look for where your residents are, we see a large number of Shakopee District residents attending kindergarten <coughs> in surrounding schools, which would suggest that the number could be much larger than we see by simply the movement of students. So um, since we last talked, Superintendent, I've been muddling this around in my head, and I think you're going to see more kids than I thought you were okay. going to see. Okay. And I will even be so bold and tell you I will make you a set of free projections after the fall of 2013, if that number is large. Okay? All right. <laughs> now, here we're taking uh, those kindergarten assumptions of the 77.6 and the 82.7, and I'm applying them against those uh, pools. And at the end, I have to project the pool from uh, projected births for Scott County. But you can see we had 624 kindergarten students, and you see that we saw that the pool was going down because of the lower birth rates. So we see that here in the kindergarten numbers reaching its low in the kindergarten of 2017-18, and then we start to see it go up. <coughs> okay, And I'm showing you the total number there because I always like to check to see how many kindergarten students did you have over the past 10 years. And you can, now we get a sense of how this projection uh, is performing against the past. And so I would expect the number to go up. This is there's nothing unusual in this, but we can see the magnitude of it. Now the other challenge I had is to make some assumptions about how many students are going to be moving into this district. And here we're looking at the configuration that you have currently. We have it by every grade, so we can reconfigure it however. Desire. But here we're looking at elementary as K-6. And the couple of things really stand out here. Number one, you always have more students showing up in elementary than you would expect. So more people are constantly moving into the district with elementary school age kids. And there's absolutely no reason to believe that that will change. Because one of the unique properties of housing in this district is that it's some of the newest housing in the metro area. Because the district has developed rapidly recently. 
So you have a lot of new housing. And new housing is more attractive to families than old housing. You know, everyone says, oh, people are going to have starter homes. No, people don't have starter homes. They, they <laughs> go for homes that meet their, their needs, their floor plan, their amenities right away. The other thing we see is that we see a large inflow at the middle school level. And that really, in, in this, is being driven by the grade 9, that transfer in from the non publics And then you see the negative numbers at the high school. And you probably ask, why are those numbers negative? Well, it's not that these children are leaving the district, but rather these numbers do not include the ALC and other programs. So that's where these students are, are moving, is the ALC, PSEO, the like. So now I'm going to use the same technique. I'm going to do some averaging. I'm going to try to stabilize these survival rates. The survival rate is really a way of combining both mortality and movement. And if the number is 1.000, that means we had the same number of students the following year as we had the previous. And if it's less than 1.00, then we can see what, uh, what we have lost. So you can see across at the K to 1 line that we're averaging about six, 5 to 6 uh, a percent increase every year. And you can see we run an increase at 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4. We're running at the 3 to 4. Look at that. It's one, uh, you know, it's about uh, just shy of 2 percent, very consistently. And then we see, of course, the uh, at 8 to 9, look at that. That's running really about 10% a year. So you can see how this all works. Now, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to combine these assumptions. And here on the migration assumption, I'm making my low the average of the past three years and the high the average of the past 10. And why am I going back 10 years? Because I, I really believe that the recession in housing, it, we're coming out of that, and we need to recapture some of the growth momentum we saw earlier. Otherwise, we're going to undershoot in the migration. We just look at the recent past. And in the projections, uh, what I'm looking at here is that I know my kindergarten projections make a bigger difference in the number of students than the migration. So I know here that's one place to shine the flashlight. Now, on these projections, I want to direct your attention to what I believe is the best projection, which is the high kindergarten assumption and the high migration assumption. And why do I think that's the best projection? Well, because of these new additional jobs in Shakopee, and that migration rates are likely to be closer to the 10-year average. Uh, number two, births are rebounding and kindergarten is likely to be at the high assumption levels. Okay? And then the past track record. Uh, as I said, I have made projections here for a number of years, and actual enrollment has been closest to the highest projections. And uh, I'm going to show you there the actual column bolded. Uh, you see my 2002 projection. Uh, and, well, let's see, we were, we were about okay until 2006, 7, and then you see the projection. Actual enrollment started to really outpace the projection. Okay. Then in 2010, I made another set of projections, and notice the difference is one student between the actual and the base of that projection. Uh, but notice that by the time I'm at 2012-13, uh, it's just luckily close to the actual. So again, always the highest projection has come in closest to where reality is. Which, of course, I said, you know, maybe in the desire to get a lower projection, it was never realistic to really think it was going to be a lower one. But anyway, that's why I would direct you to the highest projection. And this is what the highest projection looks like. 
uh, reports show others, but I think you know we don't want to spend our time. Uh, I, I, I really feel strongly about this. Uh, so you can see in 2022-23, projecting um, 9,450 students in the Shakopee Public Schools. I hear, I hear some sighing going on. And then when I take these, this projection, and now I'm looking at where I think you're going to be going as a K5, 6, 8, 9, 12. And I'm showing you the top line in bold where we are in 2012, 13, then five years out, 17, 18, and then the 10 years out at 22, 23. In here you can see that K-5 is going up uh, throughout the period, but, but in the first five years it's, it's not a large increase. You'll notice that 6-8 is going up. And then, if you notice, it drops a little bit in the second five years of the projection because we have slid down this slightly more modest elementary. See, they have aged being into middle school, and now we have a little dip in that. And then look what happens to the high school from 1900 to 3,112. And those high school numbers, are the numbers that really we have the greatest confidence in. Because these kids are born. They're already there. Okay. And then my estimate uh, is that there are 17,000 total dwelling units in this district, of which 9,166 are single family detached. That's what the Scott County property tax records say. At this point, 184 single-family detached units are projected to be built, and that's without the uh, Prior Lake portion of the district because the city of Prior Lake says, yes, they expect units to be built, but they haven't got sewer water, they don't have it platted yet, and so I didn't know whether it, they, we should count them for 2016 or not. Sometimes things happen quickly, sometimes they don't. The other question is that as development increases, more than 184 may come on. But that's that's where we stand uh, today. This district historically, when when a unit is new and you have a new 